I want to thank our worship team for leading us in that song and, and may that continue to be our heart's cry um, and may we continue to listen. Today we're going to begin a new series called Life in the Spirit, Following Jesus in Today's World. And for the next several weeks, we're going to be in Romans 12 through 16. And I think it's important that we spend time here, especially with everything going on in our world, um, with the pandemic that has been politicized, with the current issues of racism that are in our world today, continue to be here, and even the politicization of those things. In addition to that, we have an election this year. I think it's so important that we listen to God in His Word and we allow God's Word to shape us and to change us. You know, every morning when we go to work, now some of you have been working from home, so this may seem a little bit distance, but typically if you were going out in public, you would look into the mirror and you would see what changes need to happen before you present yourself to the outside world. Is there anything that needs to happen? Do you need to shave? Do you need to do your hair? Put on your makeup? Get ready so you can be presentable to the outside world. Could you imagine getting ready to go to work one day and just looking in the mirror and saying, you know what? I don't care anymore. What you see is what you get. If you have a problem with it, too bad. Now, most of us wouldn't take that approach, although in this time of being in our homes, maybe we've become more emboldened by that. But James 1, 22, or 23 through 24, reminds us that God's word is the mirror that should change us, that we look into that should change us and make us presentable to God. And this is precisely what's at the heart of Romans 12 through 16. And I wanna begin this series by today Now, I want to apply this specifically at the end to the circumstances of racism that we're seeing. But before I do, I want us to to focus on Romans 12, 1 through 2. Two verses. This is a real pivotal point in the book of Romans where we see the Apostle Paul make a shift from emphasizing what Christ has done for us in our salvation to what it is that we must do and how we can follow Jesus through our behavior, our attitude, and what that looks like. And if there's ever a time we once again in the church need to discover this, it's today. How do we follow Jesus in today's world? So I invite you to listen along or follow along. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Paul says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God, because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Can we just pause for a moment, pray? Father, I would pray that for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, that by your Spirit, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips would be pleasing and acceptable to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is a very important passage in Scripture. It's a very significant passage uh, throughout all of the Bible, and especially the Christian faith. And if I could summarize what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church in Rome, and more specifically what I believe God would have, would say to us through this word, I would say it this way. What Christ has done for us must completely change us. What Jesus has done for all people through his death, his sacrificial death coming, God himself to our world, to take the curse and our sins upon himself, to die in our place, to put an end to the evil in the human heart, to restore us to a right relationship with the Father by the death of Christ, 
to make us new through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of this he's done for us. Paul says, while we were sinners, when we were dead, God demonstrated his love for us. Christ died for us, not because we're worthy, but because of God's great love for us. Paul is saying here, what Jesus has done for you must completely change you. This is the message that Paul would give to the church at Rome after he spends over 11 chapters speaking about the gospel, the good news. The gospel isn't just what God has done for us. It's about what God through Christ by this Holy Spirit in us wants to do to change our hearts, to forgive us and free us from sin and the power of sin that leads to hate, violence, racism, and all the problems in our world today. And really there's two actions that God calls us to in this passage through the Apostle Paul. If this is going to happen, these things need to happen in your heart and my heart. And the first is we have to understand that true worship is offering your whole being sacrificially to God. God calls us through this passage to offer our whole being sacrificially to Him. This is not some optional thing where we can just come to Christ in the gospel and, and receive forgiveness of sins and be brought into this relationship with God without being changed. The gospel is also that God wants to deliver us from the power of sin in the human heart that leads to evil. You see, when Paul uses the phrase plead, it's, 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 it's a word for exhortation. It's a command. Paul is saying, look, in light of what Jesus has done for you, you must be completely changed. And that means offering yourself entirely to God. You see, justification, which is a word that we use for how when you come to God in your sins and you, you confess them to God, He declares that you're no longer guilty. You're forgiven. You're released from all the evil and sin you've done. That's by grace through faith. But sanctification, which is a word for how God, the process by which He makes us to no longer uh, be evil, but rather to become holy, set apart to Him, to wholly love Him, and to love our neighbor as ourself. That process is by grace through faith as well. So Paul says, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. What Christ has done needs to change you. And that means you need to offer yourself completely to Christ offering your bodies, this word is for all of your being to God, and we're to offer it to Him because of all that He's done for us. Christ has offered everything for us, His own life. He willingly, perfectly righteous, perfectly just, He experienced the greatest injustice of, of willingly taking our hate, my hate, upon Him so that He could forgive me and save me. And Paul says we must offer sacrificially all of ourselves to God. And this sacrifice must be living, he says. A living sacrifice means it's not a one and done. It's not a prayer we pray one day and we say, I got it, and we check a box. This is to be a life that daily we would offer ourselves sacrificially to God, to become like Him, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve Him, to love God and others fully, but it's also to be a holy sacrifice. This communicates an idea of being entirely set apart, where every part of our being is consecrated to God, is given to Him. Our opinions, our attitudes, our actions, our hobbies, our gifts, our weaknesses, we hold nothing back, but by the grace of God, we offer all of ourself. This is a picture from the Old Testament sacrificial system. In this picture, leaving no mistakes, is that Paul is saying just like individuals would bring a sacrifice to express worship to God before the altar, placing their faith that He would forgive them and as, as an animal would be, would be sacrificed completely, the picture here is that we come before the altar of God. And we don't do this literally, but we come before Him sticking our necks out, if you will, and being willing to die completely to self so that we might live for Christ. 
Church, can I remind you, Christian freedom is not getting to do what I want. It's not adding Jesus to my life so I can do what I want, say what I want, and be happy. Jesus did not come to help you accomplish the American dream. Jesus came that, that the body of sin and me and you, self-centeredness, the evil of the human heart that, that has gone wrong in our world, Jesus came to put an end to that, which means that the evil in me must die. There must be a complete death to self. Paul talks about this in Romans 6, that when we, when we trust in Christ, we become united with his death so that the body of sin might be buried and done away with and through the power of the resurrection of Jesus, we might be raised to newness of life. No longer dominated by the sinful nature, but free and free to serve and sacrifice. You see, the example of Christian freedom is not getting to do what I want. But fulfilling the law of Christ is when we follow in the steps of Jesus Christ and we pick up our cross and we suffer so that others might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In short, we do for others what the Lord Jesus has done for us. So freedom is the freedom to love God fully and it's the freedom to sacrifice our lives, to give our lives, to serve others, to share the love of God not only with our friend, but remember what Jesus said, with our enemies too. This is the call of Christ. This is a door we need to step through, and I believe it's a pathway between spiritual immaturity and true spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity isn't how long you've been in the church or how religious you are or, or a certain set of, of, of a group approved behavior that you have to have to be in the group. No, spiritual maturity is when we consecrate our lives completely to God. When we stand before his altar and we know we've been forgiven from our sins. We know we've been justified. We know that God is sanctifying us. He's making us like Jesus. But we cry out in our heart and we say, Jesus, there's more. We see what you've done for us. And in this moment, by faith, I recognize the self-centeredness that remains in my heart. And I come before you and I offer myself. But it's not a one and done. In a moment as we offer ourselves to God, He does something in our hearts. He has the power to free us from the, from the power of sin's hold over us and then to enable us to love God fully, holy love, and to love our neighbor as ourself. But it's a daily walk. Every day I have to offer myself to God. I have to be willing to take up the cross to allow, once again, for, for that sacrifice to take place, to present all of my being to God. God is calling you to offer yourself to Him. And church, it's a call for all of us. It's a call for you if you have come to faith in Christ, but you've, your life and in many areas of your life have not yet fully been transformed and you've, and you've not fully experienced Christian freedom. It's a call for you to come and in gratitude and worship because of what God has done for you to lay down your life, to allow Him to change you. But it's also a call for us daily to walk in this surrender, in this total consecration. So the first action that we're called to is to offer continually our whole being sacrificially to God. The second action is this. And, and, it, and it comes from this understanding that true change in us must come from the Spirit of Christ and not the spirit of this world. True change has to come from the genuine presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, in my heart, changing the way we think, renewing my mind. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, has to be operative in my life, and He has to be Lord, and I have to let Him change me, not the Spirit of this world. Did you catch in Romans 12 too? The battle Paul identifies for this very issue of change, true transformation in the human heart, it's in the mind or the heart. It's in the inner person where change takes place. Romans chapter 1, Paul identifies that all the evil that comes about in the world 
and, and all forms of sin find their, their origination in the human heart and mind. He's only echoing Jesus, who in Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. You see, racism is in the world because of the human heart. And while it's true that, that we're shaped by what is passed along to us, one of the things being said a lot that, that I've heard is that no one's born a racist. And I certainly agree with that statement. And I agree with that in many ways that, that we model what's taught and we pass along uh, uh, our perspective to our children. But the reason that people teach their children racism is because the human heart is corrupt. It has become sinful. And it's only by the transforming work of Jesus Christ through the gospel that a human heart can be changed. It's important that if we're going to pass along to the next generation justice, uh, if we're going to pass along and if we're going to be part of an end to racism, it has to start with your heart and my heart being dramatically changed because the human heart is sinful and selfish. And, sin, and the sinful human heart has a way of masking itself in many, many ways. So what Paul says here is he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Another translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And I think that's an accurate translation of what Paul is saying. There are pressures around us. And in order for us to truly be transformed, we do have to resist the pressures of the world that want to squeeze us into a mold that is not where true love and grace and righteousness and justice is found. You know, I want to speak to you, church, directly about this. Partisan 24 hours news outlets might be shaping us at times more than the Spirit of Christ in us. So much of the news we consume is politicized. And it's so important that what shapes us and how we think about issues in the world and what we say after we think, it must be the Spirit of the Lord Jesus in us. We must not regurgitate what we see on social media. Not much change has happened from a meme on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's not bad for us to express those things, and there's good in that. But let me call you, church, on the authority of God's Word today, that true change does not happen just through denying the presence of evil in our lives. It does not happen, happen through rebranding ourselves on social media, making a public statement. True change happens only through the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that reveals to us that something about me has to change. And true change comes through faith. When we believe in the gospel and what's gone wrong and why there's evil, why there's injustice, why there's racism in the world, and true change comes when we confess to God our own sin, our own hatred, our own prejudice, and we repent and we repent completely of our sinful ways. Jesus said it's in the human heart that murder happens. And he takes it a step for, for further in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you have anger in your heart, you've already murdered your brother. You see, Jesus looks so much deeper into our hearts. And for change to happen, it must be through us responding to the gospel in confession to God, faith, and repentance, which is a change of mind demonstrated by a change of behavior, action. But it's important that we also let God transform us into a new person. And that's the second part of Paul's command here in verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 is we must allow the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the real presence of Jesus in us, to change the way we think. Not only every day are we receiving input in our minds from the world through a number of platforms. Every day we are called to receive input 
from the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus in us through the Word of God. And we are to let the world, or, or let the presence of Christ, not the world, be what changes us to be a new person, to be truly human, which is to be created in the image of God, to love God fully, and to love others with all of our hearts, to be like Jesus Christ. We need a renewal of our minds. We need to actively allow the Holy Spirit to change us. We seek to understand His will. Paul says when we do this, there's this ability then that we come to be able to understand the will of God, that, that will of God which is pleasing, that will of God which is good and perfect. And this idea of pleasing isn't just that it pleases God, it's that as we follow Him, as we listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we understand His Word through His world and through His Word that we read specifically in Holy Scripture, His will becomes pleasing to us. It becomes pleasing and we desire more than anything to sacrifice, to serve, to listen. And it becomes pleasing to God and to us. Do you know today, God is waiting for you. And He longs for you to allow His Holy Spirit to change you into a brand new person. He wants you to be like Christ. He wants you to live as a renewed human being created in the image of God. He wants you to leave behind the sinful ways, the ways of death in this world. And He wants you to become a light for His self-giving love in this world. It's interesting, this is a passive command. Paul says we are to let the Spirit, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our minds must be renewed. We're to let God do this, and we know He does this through His Spirit, but it's something He has to do. And the thought came to me this week, how many times do we grab one of these little friends of ours and we just flip, you know this motion right here, and we just scroll. And passively, we keep consuming things, pictures, opinions. Everybody on social media needs to share their opinion. And we keep looking at opinions and thoughts about the problems of the world and the solution. And then we do one of these. We turn on the TV and we begin to watch and, and we consume passively. We just sit there and we consume news. And those aren't bad things, but yet passively, we keep letting things shape us. And especially when the majority of news we watch is very political and it has political purposes. We just keep consuming. And you know what God would say to us? Where do you sit before the Holy Spirit? Where do you open the Word of God? And where's the space in your life where you can be changed by God working and speaking to you? Where are the place that you go to pray? Where's the place of prayer? Do you have a closet? Is it the back deck? Where do you get alone with God and silence your heart and turn off the phones, turn off the TV, and you get alone and you, and you seek to know God and to love Him, to humble your heart before our almighty God, the maker of heavens and earth? Where's that place in your life? How much time are you spending opening His Word and letting Him speak to you through His Word? Is the balance between social media and the news that you watch and the entertainment? Are you listening to other opinions this much? And to be honest, there's very little space to hear from God. I know in my heart, oftentimes that's become a reality. But it's the love of God that calls us and says, I have more for you. God wants us to offer ourselves completely to Him. And He wants for us to let the Spirit of Christ change us, not the Spirit of this world. Because we're constantly listening to the opinions and the voices of this world and we need to hear from God. Because only He can expose the sin of our heart. Only He can show us what needs to change. Following Jesus in today's world begins with understanding that what Christ has done for us must fully change us. It begins with that. And that we must offer our whole beings to God and let His Spirit change us by renewing our minds. 
I believe that's where all of us need to start this week. And we're going to build on this uh, throughout this series, but I wanted to end today by sharing from my heart to you, specifically about uh, what's taken place in our country, the murder, the tragic, evil murder of George Floyd, and the continuing issues of racism in our country and in our community. And I believe I need to speak to you directly about this, and I want to humbly offer a few thoughts in light of this passage, passage that we've just opened that I believe can help us. I think the first thought is this. It's important that we understand that racism is a heart issue. It's more than just a heart issue, but it begins in the human heart. And it exists today still because of sin in the human heart. And only Jesus can change the human heart. And I want to challenge you directly, secondly, as a church and as followers of Jesus, we are called to hate racism because we love God and we love all people. Romans 12, 9 is a great verse. I'm going to paraphrase it. New Living Translation, Paul says here, we're going to get into this passage in weeks to come, that we must not just pretend to love people, but we must actually, genuinely, sincerely love other people. And then he says we are to hate what is evil and to cling, hold on to what is good. One of the worst evils, one of the most demonic worst evils in the world is that of racism that devalues another human being that is loved by God equally as important on the basis of their skin color. It is evil, it is sin. And we as followers of Jesus must hate racism. Scripture is very clear on that. But I want to challenge you. I'm a white pastor and I want to speak to our church family, especially to white Christians. We must speak. But hear me. We must listen first. If we speak without listening, we run the risk of doing more harm than good. I want to challenge you. Please do not take your talking points in what you say and what you dwell on from a 24-hour news outlet that is partisan and is political. And let me tell you, church, and I mean this from my heart, do not copy. Do not copy your behavior from politicians who hold up Bibles. We saw this on either side, both Republican and and democratic this week. The Bible is not a political tool. We must let what's in the Bible, the written word of God, and what's in us, the living word, Jesus, be what changes us. Church, please don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. We have to let Christ in us shape us. So listen. Listen first to God, and then let me tell you, we must listen to the African-American community, especially church. Hear me. We need to listen to African-American Christians, our brothers and sisters. I'm confident if we listen, we will understand that racism, personal racism, and systems of racism still exist today that are currently harming people of color. We will understand that African Americans have a different experience than white people in our country today. And we need to listen well. And if we listen well, we'll understand the hurt that comes from when we as white people say all lives matter. We need to be willing to say black lives matter. Nowhere in their, that statement is a devaluing of all human life. We know every human life matters. Our theology, the Bible teaches us that every person is created, loved by God in his image. But when we say black lives matter, we recognize the personal, institutional, in structural forms that still exist of racism today that have negatively impacted the African-American community.
community. To say Black Lives Matter does not mean that you endorse all the actions of the organization with that same name. But you are standing and you are communicating the sacredness of every human life, especially those who have been devalued in our nation, in the black community. I also want to challenge you, this is really important, if we're going to listen to the African American community, and specifically Christians during this time, it's impossible for us to do this without relationships. It's hard to listen when you don't know and love and walk with anybody. For real change to happen, it must be in the heart, and it has to happen and start with the church in America. I'm going to ask you a question. This isn't an easy question to ask, and I'm not trying to tear you down, but it's a question that we all must ask. Do you have a relationship with another Christian across a racial divide? Do you have a deep, close friendship with an African-American follower of Jesus? How can you listen? How can we understand if we do not? Can you really believe that your understanding on the issues are correct if you have not taken time to listen in the context of a genuine, caring, authentic relationship? Could you, like our manual says, covertly be contributing to the disease? Maybe not intentionally, but, you're, but is it possible that you could covertly be contributing to the disease of racism within our country without even knowing it? You see, the Spirit of Jesus in us demands that we develop relationships across racial divides and barriers. Church, we've forgotten the gospel. Look at the Samaritan woman. Think about the divide. Go back from there. Jesus left heaven. Philippians 2, he crossed the divide from the eternal to the here and now for you and me because of our sins and our hatred. And even though he did that, we crucified him. We murdered him. Yet he did that to forgive us. Do you remember Jesus, a Jewish male, walked and he had to go through Samaria in John 4. And do you remember that Jesus sat next to a Samaritan woman crossing a racial religious divide where each group hated each other? Church, we bear the name of Jesus. We bear the name of Jesus. Remember Ephesians 2, that Jesus in his death sacrificially for us has torn down the wall of hostility. There's no longer any barrier. And together he creates one new humanity. One new humanity of all people. Every tribe, every nation, every people. One new people bought by the blood of Jesus. One blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. How can we preach that gospel? How can we preach that gospel if we don't have a desire in our heart to develop loving relationships, especially with African Americans who are followers of Jesus with us. Jesus is calling us to be different. The world needs us to be different. And your response might be, I just don't know anybody. And we make excuses. I've made excuses before. But there's something God's revealed to me and I want to share it with you. If you are willing, God will make a way. Because there's one body, there's one Lord, there's one faith. Revelation 7, 9 paints a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like. When God's kingdom is fully realized, it's this picture of the throne room of God and, 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 and a whole people are clothed in robes that are white, symbolizing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And there this picture is of every tribe, every nation, every people gathered together before the throne in one voice, full of the love of God, worshiping the one God. That's the kingdom of God. And how can we pray the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come now. Your will be done. Your name be honored. And not hunger and desire to worship 
right now, for worship on earth right now to be like worship is in heaven. So I want to ask you, are you willing, is God calling you not just to rebrand on Facebook, not just to say something, but to develop deep, deep relationships across racial divides? If God's calling you, let me tell you, church, the church is the hope of the world. And it's not just this church. It's all believers, all churches. Start with Christians. Get to know Christians. Pray, and if you're willing, God will make a way. I want to share how God has done that for me. About four years ago, I did not have a deep friendship with an African-American Christian. I wanted a friendship, but I didn't have a deep friendship. And God put it upon my heart, and He put a hunger and a desire to have a close, deep, discipling relationship with an African-American Christian. I was desiring that not because I wanted people to know. I haven't posted. I haven't, I don't care about that. I, it was the love of Jesus that hungered for this relationship. I wanted this kind of friendship because that's the way the kingdom of heaven is. And the gospel I preach demands it needs to be that way now. And you know, God, through his Holy Spirit, it wasn't me. He started to make me willing. And I started to pray. And I'll never forget, just a few years ago, I got an invitation to go to Peoria Christian School to go to a pastor's appreciation banquet. And if I'm honest, I was dreading it. Because I was focused in ministry, and, I, and it was kind of a distraction. And I remember praying that morning, and I sensed the Holy Spirit say to me, what if I want to show you something today? And I remember it was a clergy appreciation banquet, and it was so wonderful. PCS did a great job of it, wonderful event. But I remember praying and sensing the Holy Spirit ask me, Mark, I could want to show you something today. Will you open your heart to that? So I started praying, and I said, God, if there's something you want to show me today, I'm listening. I'm looking. And I remember coming into this room at Peoria Christian, and I met a man named Frank who uh, worked there and was hosting the event. And as I began to talk to Frank at Peoria Christian School, we were ta- he was talking about what church I'm from, and he began to talk about his pastor, Pastor Marty, who's an African-American pastor at New Beginnings Ministries of Peoria. And he was talking about how much he loves his pastor in his genuine heart. And in my heart, something welled up, not even knowing who Pastor Marty is. And I sensed that tap of the Holy Spirit saying, Mark, I want you to go talk with him. I want, you to, I want you to reach out and I want you to offer to get together, just to get to know each other. Not even knowing if he'd be receptive to that, I walked over and I introduced myself to Pastor Marty and said, I'd love to meet with you sometime. I just feel like God wanted me to come over and say that. Pastor Marty said, let's do it. And I'll never forget the two to three hour meeting when I first met him in, in the office of New Beginnings Ministries and we talked for two to three hours and there were tears that I shed in that moment a few years ago. When as an African-American man, pastor who grew up here in Peoria began to share experiences that he has experienced in his life, and it began to cause me to weep. And what humbled me more than anything was the love of Jesus in his heart. Every reason to hate me, every reason to say, why are you coming down here? Who do you think you are? But there was the love of Jesus Christ. He loved me. And from that began a friendship. And God has blessed me. Our churches have begun to serve together in some capacities. Pastor Marty attended our, our, our missions trip a few years ago that I wasn't able to attend. He ministered to me through the loss of, of the death of my father last year. We hunted together. I was able to see him kill his first deer. And to this day and throughout this whole situation, I've been in daily, almost daily contact with him. And he has become one of the most significant relationships I have in the body of Christ. And I am a better follower of Jesus. And I'm happy to follow his lead, to listen to him. Church, I share that because I'm confident that if you're willing, if the desire's there, that you would not wait till you get to heaven to develop a deep relationship across a racial divide. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. The Spirit of Jesus calls you to do it now. And if you'll just become willing, God will make away. To me, it's a matter of obedience. I'm excited 
about the day potentially where we can gather in a church, join together with African American followers of Jesus, white followers of Jesus, and people of all race. But more than that, I think what honors God is when we gather at the table in our homes. You see, it's not about show. It's not about pride. It's not about being seen not as a racist. No, it's about the genuine love of Jesus, imploring you to love and to build that relationship. We must genuinely love. So as we wrap it up today, I just want to give a few final comments and then we will pray together. The first is this, just a reminder, what Christ has done in us must completely change us. Today, do you hear His voice calling to you? If you do, do not harden your heart to Him. I do not desire you to hear my voice or opinion. You don't need another voice or an opinion. My hope and prayer is that what I've shared is from the Word of God, from the heart of God, and that you would hear His voice and you would respond to Him. Offer yourself right now completely to Him. Your thoughts, your opinions. Commit to let Him change you daily by renewing your mind. This means you're going to have to resist. You're going to have to let go of other voices that are really loud right now. Other things that are passively being input into you, you might have to turn off. And you need to open your heart to listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to people, genuine people, the experience of others. Secondly, if you do not have a genuine loving relationship with another believer across a racial divide, I just want to ask you, and I believe God would have me ask you, do you believe this is pleasing to Jesus? You know, it's easy to make excuses, but I promise you, if you're willing, because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there's one blood. If you're willing, and if you'll humble your heart and ask God and pray, He will make a way. And then finally, I want to invite you with me to commit to listen and to love during this time. There's a time for speaking up. And we are called to stand against racism. But church, let's listen first and let's love deeply and let's check our motives. It was on Monday, May 25th, that George Floyd, for eight minutes and 46 seconds, pled for his life. And he said this phrase, I cannot breathe. I can't breathe. And there... A man had his knee driven deeply into his neck, would not allow him to breathe, and George Floyd was murdered. And you know what's so sickening about this is when we go back to Genesis, the image of God was put in every human being. And God breathed into Adam and Eve, making them a living being. It was the breath of God, man and woman, all people created in His image. And here's a man saying, I can't breathe. The image of God was devalued in the life of George Floyd. He was murdered. And I would invite you, I think it's important for us as a church to listen. Listen to the wounds that have been reopened. Listen to the experiences that are taking place in the African-American community. Listen. Listen to the issues of racism that still exist today. Listen humbly. And before we speak, let's listen well. And then let's stand because we are called to hate racism and to seek justice. So I want to invite you on Mondays at either 8.46 a.m. or 8.46 p.m to take that time since it was on a Monday that George Floyd was murdered. And I want you to set an alarm on, alarm on your phone and I want you to sit before God silently to listen to Him. I want you to turn off your media and I want you to get alone with God. 
and I want you to humble yourself. And I want you to ask God through the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ in you to change you, to show you, I don't know what I don't know. I can't see what I can't see. I need to listen to the experience of others. And we're going to take this time for 8 minutes and 46 seconds to sit silently. And then I want you to cry out to God for justice, for righteousness, and that you would ask God, first and foremost, to change you and change me. Pray Romans 12, 9. Don't merely pretend to love. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Seek, search out. Pray that your heart would be willing that we might develop deep, deep relationships across racial divides, not for our glory, but so that we may see the church of Jesus Christ become. We want the church on earth to be like the church in heaven for the glory of God so that the whole world could come to see the glory of Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I know I'm nothing without you. Father, the desire of this time we spend together, Lord, is to hear from you. And we know so many times we're blinded by what we can't see. And Father, we pray. We pray in our hearts today. Father, number one, we pray for our own souls, our own hearts, our own minds. And we want to confess, Lord, any way, any way that my heart is being shaped more by the world around than by the Spirit of Jesus within. I want to repent of that in the name of Jesus right now. Father, as you show us, if there's any forms, whether it's active or passive, of racism, of prejudice in our hearts, Father, we want your forgiveness. It's through confession, repentance, and genuine change as we trust in you that our hearts are made new. We know that racism and all evil, it's a sin issue that starts in the heart and then it affects relationships, societal structures, and it spreads like a cancer and a disease everywhere. And if we're ever going to see a change, it has to start in the human heart. And you call us as Christians to come together in this. So Father, right now we want to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. <laughs> Jesus, you've done so much for us. You've crossed the greatest divide for our sins, and we confess that we were not worthy. But because you've justified me freely, you've forgiven me of my own sin and the evil of my heart, the hatred in our hearts, and through Jesus and being united with his resurrection, you've made us a brand new being, forgiven and new. You break the cycles of hatred that rule in our world, and you make us like Jesus. Father, we pray that the Spirit of Jesus would change us as we offer all of ourselves to you. Not just one and done. In this moment, could we surrender ourselves? Could we drive a stake like the old uh, pastors used to say, have a moment where we trust in you and we say, I want to die to self. And may it be so. May I, be, may I consider myself dead to sin as I offer myself to you just as you offered yourself for me. And may the Holy Spirit of Jesus, Christ in me through the Word of God, be the loudest voice that changes me to become a new person. Father, as we pray, we pray for the family of George Floyd and the many others who've experienced tragic, unjust death. Father, we pray you'd be with this family right now. And Father, we pray for all who've experienced racism and who still do today in our world of any race. And Father, we'd ask that you would help us as the church to be an instrument that listens first and then speaks out and seeks to work for an end to these things. But remind us it's through the gospel. Father, we pray as well today. We know the pressures. Father, I feel led to pray as well by what these evil few, very small minority of police officers did. They've cast a dark light over all police officers. And while we know the vast majority of police, 99% or more perhaps, we don't know, are really, really good people who sacrifice and they serve. And Father, help them during this time, Father, to show restraint. Father, protect them, watch over them. And Father, we pray for their protection. 
while at the same time we pray for justice, and especially for the family of George Floyd and the many others, we seek justice and we seek an end to the systems, Father, that are still unfavorable to the African-American community and others. Help us to be a part of the solution, Lord. Father, change us. Lead us through this series. For the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen.